Keep in touch with the Wolf Connection podcast on our Instagram handle at the Wolf Connection Pod or email us your questions, comments, and guest ideas to podcast at wolfconnection.org. Thank you for your support and howls to you all. Welcome to the Wolf Connection podcast. I'm your host, John Calvin. So for all of you that are listening, we have mentioned the series Island of the Sea Wolves many, many times. And just so happens that in Instagram conversation and through DM and everything else and, and sharing posts of these incredible videos and photos and everything that's come out of that series, we happen to be chatting with today one of the Emmy Award winning cinematographers for that incredible series that's on Netflix right now. If you haven't seen it, I think you've been living under a rock somewhere. Uh, it's just incredible storytelling, incredible visuals. Um, and this individual not only has worked uh, for things with Netflix, but he's done stuff for Disney+, Plus, BBC, CBC, Nat Geo. Um, he's based in Canada, and he's just an incredible individual that we are very excited to have on, James Freistack. James, first of all, once again, congratulations on the Emmy win for you and and your team, really, uh, the guys who were, you were cinema, uh, doing the cinematography with. How's everything going for you? How the holidays been treating you? How's, how's everything going just in general? Oh, holidays have been great. And thanks so much for having me. This Thank is uh, really exciting. Big fan of the podcast. So um, yeah, excited to be here. And uh, yeah, holidays have been great. Very, very relaxing, actually. Taking some time to recalibrate and reassess and try to plan for 2024. So a lot of moving parts there. So yeah, it's been good. Yeah. It's just, uh, just give everybody who's out there, what, what was that moment like? I, I guess one for when you were nominated first off, and then to act to win and to be up there and accepting this award for, like I said, really an incredible series that really, I think, caught people at the right time and, and everybody was looking for something that was magical and and just inc- the storytelling is just really, really intense and very, very realistic. And, and it's obviously it's realistic because of nature. But what were those moments like for you to be nominated and then ultimately win for something like this? Yeah, just to get the nomination, I, I was actually completely blown away. Um, you know, this is um, this is that was my first series actually as a camera operator. So I transitioned from a uh, camera assistant primarily. I kind of did do a few side shoots here and there. I'd pick up like you know second camera or B camera, and uh, this series they actually trusted me with a camera and sent me on my own shoots, and I was able to capture some incredible stories and some kind of magical moments. So. Um, and it was a hard series to pull together. Uh, we only had a, about eight months of shooting time, uh, but there was like approximately 600 days with the shooting time. So we had a massive team of cinematographers out in the field nonstop. And it was an undertaking to say the least. Like we'd be <laughs> changing camera gear out in the field. We'd be just, you know, high five each other, say good luck in the next shoot as we kind of our, our ships <laughs> cross or pass crossed. And uh, then at the end of it all, at the end of all the shooting, we just carried on to our next projects and uh, months go by and the series got released. And then we found out that it got nominated and we were just absolutely ecstatic. Yeah, it was, yeah, pretty amazing. And how does that feel to move up to camera operator? It has to be like a whole new world of of pressure probably. But how, how did that feel and, and kind of what did you learn in that uh, transition? Yeah, <laughs> that pressure's on for sure. Yeah, because you have to perform. And um, uh, fortunately, I was surrounded by incredible cinematographers. Our team over at River Road Films, there's just some heavy hitters up in that in camp and uh, led by Jeff Turner. So we had great direction. We had great mentors and they really gave me the confidence uh, I needed to, to get out there and do the job that, that yeah. they required. So, yeah. Wild. Yeah, it's just wild. What was it? What, how, what what was your path like to th- this point ultimately? Because obviously cinematographer or, or doing photograph and film can take many different avenues. What was it like for you to get to this point? Where did, were you, were you born and raised in Canada? How did everything get, you know, ultimately get to the, you know, to the apex of, of being an Emmy award winner? Yeah. I mean, my story takes a lot of twists and turns and I grew up as a typical small town kid in Southern Ontario, just playing hockey. And I lived in like a really, really small town. And it was a farming community, actually, of like less than 3000 people. And there really wasn't much to do. And we would get jobs in the summertime, picking fruit and vegetables and picking tobacco of all things. And um, and there really wasn't much to do. And I usually found myself just getting into trouble. And, <laughs> and uh, after high school, I went to college and dropped out within a couple of months because I needed to just go travel and 
you know, see some of the world and experience the world to find out what I actually wanted to do. And uh, I ended up uh, working on an oil rig in northern Alberta, of all things. And um, that only lasted 10 days. That was a horrible job. I thought it was going to be rich beyond my wildest dreams and had this big truck and had this big dream of what it was going to be like. And yeah, 10 days later, I was, had to get the hell out of there. That was terrible. And uh, so then I ended up um, moving into Calgary when I was 19 years old. And I was a pretty young guy and just wanted to go snowboarding and climbing and just adventuring and exploring. And then I ended up uh, working various construction jobs, just trying to find my footing, figure out what to do. And then uh, I ended up becoming an electrician and I thought that would be a great job. And, and it was, it was actually a really terrific job. It was very flexible. It paid really well and it allowed me to go travel to all these amazing places that I've always wanted to travel to. So I ended up going to like Thailand and Vietnam and kind of exploring all over the world. And, um, and uh, kind of a long story here, but eventually I just vividly remember just one day I was driving the Sea to Sky Highway up near Squamish. I was going to do some climbing up there. And I thought to myself that, you know, I travel all over the world. I go do these amazing sports and see all these incredible places, but I never bring a camera with me. I never, I have like, you know, my, my cell phone, I think it was like, I had like an iPhone five at the time or something like that. I don't even remember. Yeah. Terrible photos and maybe a GoPro and. And then like some that day I was just like, I, I need to get a real good camera and figure out how to use this thing. And so like that day I went and bought like my first DSLR camera and just started going to work and trying to figure this thing out. Wow. I mean, it just, I mean, it seems as though we have a lot of these, these stories and, and not to say that yours is, isn't unique, but a lot of people who've, some who've worked nine to fives, they do different jobs and then they just, they're out visiting the wonderful places and the wild places like you have. And you, you had the, pleasure of growing up in some of these, these spots and just really wanted to capture them and share them with everybody else. And that's, and it's, we're all grateful for it, that you made the turn to, to ultimately get that camera, that DSLR and, and do the work you're doing. What was it about wild places and, and wild animals and everything in these places that drew, sort of drew you in? Cause obviously you were saying you, you climbed a lot and you were doing a lot of the outdoor, outdoor adventure type things, but what was it about you wanting to record them, share these stories, share these places that you've been that sort of made you want to ultimately get into this profession? Yeah, I was still working as an electrician while I was developing my skills as a photographer. And I never really thought like, how could I do this full time? But a friend of a friend reached out to me um, and asked if I was able to assist him on this National Geographic project. And I was like, this is like my wildest dreams have come true. Like I can actually be like this adventure action sports photographer. This is, this is it. This is so cool. I can be the assistant and, you know, he didn't have a huge budget. So he paid me an experience, which I'm still grateful for. And um, while I was on assignment with him, we were climbing uh, Mount Rainier and we camped on the summit for six days. And we did this big scientific research project when they tried to like map out the crater rim of Mount Rainier. And so we're ice caving and doing scientific gatherings and stuff like that. And, um, and then just learning from that photographer, his name is Francois. He was like, he, he said, this was my dream was to come to National Geographic and be a photographer. This is like, I thought my dream was to come true as well. But uh, the reality is it's tough. It's really, really hard. And uh, this is going to be his last, last Nat Geo assignment he was going to do. And he was going to go right into video. And I was like, uh, okay, <laughs> what does that mean? And then he told me that, you know, photography is great and everything like that. But if you want to make some real money and, you know, how this is a career, uh, photography is incredibly challenging. You might want to think about video. And I thought a lot about that. And uh, so I started switching my focus more to video based things. And um, I ended up uh, losing my job as an electrician in 2016. And uh, I ended up contacting some of my climbing buddies and I said, Hey guys, I've got all this free time off. I got my camera. Let's go out and shoot some stuff. And, uh, five weeks later after that, I was by myself in Alaska and I, I climbed to Dali and, uh, and that trip was pretty transformative in a lot of ways. It was kind of like my, my breaking away from electrician. I'm going to do this. I'm going to go be a creative owner, be a do the creative arts somehow. And this is what I want to do. And then after that trip, I, met a, another friend of a friend who um, was doing natural history projects and I didn't know too much about natural history and shooting wildlife. I never really thought of that as a career, 
But the way he explained it and the way he talked about it, I'm like, that is that sounds like an amazing adventure. That sounds really cool. And um, Alex just said, he's like, yeah, we hire camera assistants every once in a while. We'll give you a call someday and that'd be great. And usually those things don't really turn into much. But, you know, about a year later, I actually got the call. And um, then I went out on my first like national or sorry, my first natural history shoot as a camera assistant and then that, i was like okay now this is it this is this is my people this is where i want to be i want to tell these stories this is yeah so when you but right before you got that opportunity i'm just totally curious how, like what did you think how did you think you were going to turn it into a viable career that actually paid the bills like what 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 was in your mind when you said all right i'm going to ditch the electrician thing i'm going to start filming i'm still trying to figure that out honestly um i i had a lot of you know like having that electrician certificate gave me like a lot of like reassurance that if it doesn't work out i could always go back so i just felt like i had this like like i have got nothing to lose i might as well just go for it anyway and you know i could always just go start pulling wire again like an electrician but um and that kind of gave me some fuel and then um I ended up working on some movie sets. Like I got a job working on like big, um, like television shows and big um, shows that weren't natural history. So I did do that, supplement my income like that for a while until I started to like really dig my heels in and really figure out how to do this. So it was more just like saying yes to everything related to shooting, like anything, anything that came up, even if I was busy. And actually that job uh, working in those TV shows was super flexible and very supportive. So if I just got the call saying, Hey, James, we need you to go to, you know, Saskatchewan for two weeks. Uh, can you go on like a moment's notice? I was like, yes, I'm going. Yes. And then, <laughs> so I just say yes to absolutely everything. hundred percent, hundred percent. Wow. No, that's unreal. Just, uh, I mean, I, I want to, uh, I want to dive into to Island of uh, the Sea Wolves because it's just I remember when it when it came out and just like the just really I mean National Geographic oh, oh, is kind of like the bar I think for visuals especially when we're talking about you know wildlife and wild places and everything like that I know BBC and, and CBC and every, everybody's it, it's almost like we're trying to get to that part of it just what was it when you when you got there when you heard about the assignment and now you're on the ground in, on Vancouver Island and we've spoken with Tom McPherson, who runs Seaforth Expedition, so I'm sure you guys have, you know, worked with there. What was your first overall, just looking at the environment? What was your, what were those first initial thoughts when you get on the island and you know this is going to be the next eight months of your life? Um, it's, it's pretty full on, I guess. Like, like it, it's. I think well, when we first started the series, it was February. And I was on the first shoot out the door and uh, it was the middle of February. It was cold. It was miserable. There were storms. And it was just like, we we're trying to get boats in incredibly remote areas and trying to deal with float planes and all sorts of weather conditions and dealing with hundreds of thousands of dollars with the camera gear at the same time. And we're trying to remote camp and, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty full on while you're out there. So, but at the same time, I mean, with all my experience of climbing and my backpacking experience and traveling, I, I just, I kind of feel comfortable in those environments. So, you know, with all the exposure that I've had, I didn't, I was more excited than anything. I was just like, bring it on, like you throw whatever you got at me. And I just kind of <laughs> love to suffer, I guess. Uh, well, I have two questions actually. What were you, what were yeah. you, when you first, when you first got, got into the, the mix, what were you, I mean, what was like your greatest, I don't want to say fear, but like, what were you most worried about and what were you most excited about? Actually, before Island of the Sea Wolves started, I did go out on a wolf shoot with Tom and it was at a different location at a different time. So I think it was like 2020 or something like that. And I've never seen a wolf before. And I, I was like, I, I, you know, I had this like a bit of fear in me a little bit um, going, okay, I don't really know what I'm getting into. I've never spent a lot of time with wild animals, like, like, you know, big animals like this, uh, big predators. And so I was a bit nervous. And um, I remember day one, we sat down, we put up our blinds, I got my camera up. And within a couple hours, we started coming out. Actually, we like Tom got us in the perfect spot. It was incredible. And I, I don't know how he pulls this off, but <laughs> guys remarkable. And anyway, um, yeah, so he cut us in the right spot. And I remember this wolf came right up to my hide. And I was like, Oh, I'm definitely not hiding from this, this wolf. That's for sure. <laughs> and um, it just stood there kind of looked at me, did a little head tilt, just kind of like a dog. And then it just kind of wandered off a little bit, curled up a little ball and took a nap. I'm like, 
what? You're the big bad wolf? <laughs> like, okay, this is interesting. And then uh, day after day after day, it was just like, oh, I couldn't get enough of them. I was like, okay, I just got really excited that the wolves are coming nearby. And I so I kind of, before Island of the Sea Wolves started, I knew, you know, the behavior of these wolves very well. So I felt very comfortable going in there. And uh, yeah. That's awesome. I always wonder with filming like this, ju just how hard it is to capture complete stories of an of a of a of a species like wolves. Of course, you're, there's probably species you are seeing all the time that you're not you're not really meaning to focus on. But in terms of animals like this, or bears, or or, or something, or, or mountain lions, <clears throat> um, how do you how do you set out to capture complete stories like something that's not just you know disconnected b-roll but but actually a, some kind of story you can tell from start to to finish yeah that's the beauty of it for sure and and the the, the honest truth is time and money you got you got to have a lot of boots on the ground you got to spend a tremendous amount of time out there and you got to work your butt off like you have to be out there from bef before sun like an hour before sunrise and you're there until you know it's pitch dark and you got to wait for those moments and you got to just be at the, at the right place the right time understand their behavior and just just keep digging to keep grinding i think for island of the sea wolves um just for that series alone i spent i think it was close to 12 weeks um in eight months of my life filming those wolves yeah were there a lot of st untold stories like stories you meant to get you know, some kind of complete arc, but just didn't, didn't happen. Oh, for sure. Uh, I know like one of my assignments was actually to get some wolves catching salmon. We had like built out this entire script and this whole storyline of these wolves catching salmon on the salmon river. And I sat at this river for, it was a 17 day shoot. And on day 16, I saw my first wolf and um, I was like, okay, they're here. And, but there was no there's no option to stay longer. Like we had to leave immediately because there's a massive storm coming in. For like this day 16, the wolves showed up. I got a couple of shots and I came home with, you know, not the story they hoped. So um, then we just had to move on and they just have to make it work in the edit. So wow. that's got to be something too when you're when you're dealing with production producers, EPs, things like that, when you're when you're hoping for or writers even, when you're hoping for a story. And you really just have to almost have a short term memory and also just kind of be a duck and just let things sort of roll off your back in that way. In that, like you said, you're, you're on the shoot for 17 days, day 16, they come and you go, okay, well, we just got to scrap it and move on to the next thing. I mean, is that, wow. does that seem like something that's typical for oh, yeah. these types of shoots? Yeah, yeah it has to be. Yeah. I, I've been on shoots where they just are completely busts where, you know, the animals don't show up or, um, unfortunately, some of the animals are killed or just something happens and it's out of your control. So you just have to move on. It's it's, it's natural history. It's wildlife. You can't control anything uh, at that point. So you just have to just move on to the next story and the next beat. So Wow. Was this your, have you, were you ever at Vancouver Island prior to this, prior to doing Island of, sea, Island of sea Wolves? Or I can't remember if, if that was something, or is this was your first venture over there? Oh no! I spent lots of lots of time on big oh, okay. over the years for sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what and and like, so so you're doing that, and like when you're when you're doing these stories. So were you were you you were part of the main? What was your assignment or assignments? Were you just with the wolf part of it? Like, what were the what were the main mm -hmm. wolf stories that you that you were doing for them? Yeah, there there are a lot of cinematographers that worked on the wolf story, like Dave and Kieran and. And uh, yeah, a bunch of us were out there and Matt and Casey, but um, yeah, so um, yeah, my, my main story was actually the Vancouver Island Marmot. I spent uh, quite a bit of time filming the marmots and, and I thought, I thought, you know, I'm like, oh, marmots is going to be easy. <laughs> and, you know, what, what do marmots do? They're, I thought they were kind of, I, I did really have an emotional a connection or attachment to these animals, but day after day after day, week after week, you spend so much time and understanding their behavior and their their little quirks and they're just the way they move and their behavior and you start to identify them as individuals and you get to follow around and see their little daily lives and, and how they interact and then you just can't help but fall in love with these guys they're so cool they are so cool man Marmots. yeah yeah <laughs> and then also aside from that I also worked on a lot of bald eagle stuff um i worked on a big elk story that never made the cut unfortunately and um what else oh yeah it worked on the herring spawn and yeah quite a bit of stories worked on I mean, it's just when you when you finally see everything come together, and I mean, as Steven said, we're 
we're in the creative side too. And, you know, when you're shooting and even in a sanctuary for that instance, when you're trying to shoot and get the B-roll and get, like you said, to tell the story you're trying to tell. And we go through and we shoot hours of stuff. And <laughs> Stephen will say to me sometimes like, well, I got about five seconds out of the two hours that we shot. I'm like, all right, cool. So we got to go back and do it all over again. What's the, I always wonder about this with other cinematographers and photographers. What's the mental, what's your mental state? In, not even your mental state, but your mental, um, like how you approach these things. You know, is it very, like I said, very sort of even keeled. It's just going to be what it's going to be. And that's how it goes. I know, like, are there any practices that you do to be like, all right, this is just sort of the way it goes. And like you said, it's the natural life or natural, you know, wildlife. So nothing is, you know, they don't, there's not a roll call. You know what I mean? They just sort of come up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, it, it's unpredictable. You never know what's going to, you know, what you're going to get. And um, yeah, my, my expectations, I usually set them high. I set the bar really, really high, as high as I possibly can. I try to think of like the best case scenario, how this is going to play out. But if it doesn't happen, well, then maybe I didn't do my job right. I don't know. Or maybe just the animals didn't show up or there's just, there's just so many variables of filming wildlife. It's just, it's just too unpredictable. So um, I don't really take it to heart really. And I, you know, I just, I can, I can just move on to the next story if I don't get what I need or what we anticipated on getting though. In, and though it, it, these projects are incredibly expensive and I've been on and wildly expensive shoots, like, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars shoots and came home with nothing and you just have to say all right well i guess that was that and we got to move on we just got to tell the story somewhere else and where, where does most of the budget go is it to equipment and travel or or something else that we're not thinking of uh yeah i mean it depends on the location for sure like if you're going up to baffin island for example like that place is so remote and so expensive to get to and we have to carry so much equipment so we try to limit what we bring but unfortunately like you know our our it would just you just show up with hundreds and hundreds of pounds of equipment and so a lot of sometimes it's baggage or sometimes it's uh goes towards like paying for guides and lodging and there's just a lot of things that go involved and then you think of all the post production side of things like the the sound and music and um all the editing and it's just it's just like a huge undertaking so were there any stories that you were tasked with with capturing that just like came together that that were easier than you expected them to be that ended up in the film Hmm. Um, you know, like some of this stuff just works out. Yeah. I, I did a black bear shoot again on Vancouver Island and they only gave me, I think it was five days or six days. And I had to pull off this whole sequence of bears catching salmon. And it was like, I, was like, I need more days. I was pretty worried. <laughs> like I, like five, six days. That's, that's usually not enough. I need two weeks or something like that. But, um, this is, it was a, a lower budget show. And so that's all they could afford. So I just had a crack at it. And then all the stars aligned and it just everything worked out. We had a wicked salmon run and the bears were just they're full on. They were just everywhere. It was all day. I was just like I was filling cards every day. I couldn't even shoot the whole day. Wow. I run out of batteries. I was like, oh, wow, wow this yeah. is awesome. This is worked just so well. <laughs> oh, so, wow. yeah, it was awesome. And they do. And there's like there is there a team of people that goes out and scouts before you guys get there with all this expensive gear and stuff like so, you know, kind of the trajectory of it. I mean. Animals are hard to find in a lot of cases. I don't know how they are on, on Vancouver Island, but you know, they're, they're, these predators are difficult to find. Is there someone who scouts beforehand, or, or how do you kind of get a, a tip on, on where to even start? Yeah, it's it's local with local knowledge. A lot of times, yeah. we work with First Nation communities. We work with that's awesome scientists and researchers. Uh, sometimes we do the scouts ourselves, or we just we just no spots over the years like jeff turner the owner of river road films he he's a veteran at this and he he just knows animal behavior so well and he just knows okay this time of year this behavior is happening let's look in this region at this time and hopefully we'll get that story and then they'll just throw the researchers in and go all right is this is this possible can we make this happen so the planning goes months and sometimes even years in advance to like before we actually are on the ground with cameras so so uh, interesting. So, yeah. That's wild. Who have ultimately came up with the premise of Island of Seawolves and how did they get everybody together? Was that was that Netflix wanting to do this? Who 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 I guess contacted who and how did the how did this all sort of come together because it seemed like a lot of moving parts and for the for kind of a big event for something like this. Yeah, as far as I know, I I wasn't in those conversations when they first came up. But right. There's a company in the UK in Bristol called Wild Space owned by James, James Honeyborn. And, um, he want, he 
had a contract with Netflix to do a bunch of their natural history series for uh, for a couple of years. So they they put they, they built this big contract up, and then they started thinking about it. And I think it was partially COVID related that they just said, "Well, there's an entire film crew in Vancouver. Why don't we just like hand this project off to River Road Films and let them let let them run with it? Because we're more than functional, more than capable crew of pulling this off, and we're it's right in our backyard. So they don't have to fly their camera crews in the UK and spend all that extra money to come out here when the, they have the locals can just do it and do a great job at it. So, um, so I believe it was, it was kind of, that's kind of how it worked out. So it was like this co-production with wild space and river road films. And so once all the edit was like, you know, once we all collected all the, all the footage and they were ready to go into the edit, uh, Jeff and his daughter, Chelsea, uh, moved out to the UK for a few months and they worked on the edit there and that's where they finished the edit off there. Was there anything, I, I Steve might have already asked this, but when you saw the final product, was there anything that you shot or anything that you saw that you were like, oh, I wish there was like one more, you know, one more shot of this or something like that? I'm sure there's always there's always something. But was there anything that sort of stuck out in your mind that that you know you were on a shoot for that the story and you're like, oh, they didn't use whatever that shot or that sequence? Uh- <laughs> Yeah, like a lot, <laughs> but like off the top of my head, do I have a very specific like shot or story? No, no, no. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, like there were some stories I just did make the cut. Unfortunately, there was some beautiful stuff with elk and hummingbirds and and raccoons and all these like other cool stories. Um, but when they came to the edit, they're just like, ah, oh, what do we got to cut? Yeah. They just decided. They just decided like let's let's uh, let's do less. Let's have less stories and make them more intimate because we got so much great stuff with the wolves and the bears and we could just tell these like deep, deeper stories, I think. And, and that's where I think they they really did a great job. And I think that's why it was so successful because they took the time with their edit. They took the time telling their stories and really digging deep into them, not just kind of skimming the surface, but actually like letting the story breathe and getting connected to these animals and like actually caring about them. So that's, that's yeah, hats off to that writing team and the directing team for that. It was great. So, so, in an, I mean, an abstract sense, I don't know. In in your own words, I should say, what what is Island of the Sea Wolves about? Is it about wolves? Is it about an island? Is it is there a moral to this story? What what is this the story that's being told in in your mind? It's about an island. It's about a location. It's a place on Earth that exists, and and it just filled with abundance of life. There's actually so much beauty there, and. Uh, one, one of the, like actually one of my favorite comments that I get like I read the comment sections on like trailers and things get shared I'm just kind of curious about and, and I have a lot of conversations with other photographers I I continually go to Vancouver Island and have conversation with other filmmakers and photographers and um, um, I, I like talking to the older generation actually like people that are you know 60 plus and they go I lived here for 30 years I lived here for 40 years I've lived here my whole life I had no idea I had no idea that this existed and that that right there blows me away. You, they've spent so much time, and they get to learn so much about their own backyard, and just to see, like you know, that appreciation and that awe that they have, and and how that story was told and, and shown, and and highlighting the beauty of of this place. I mean, what what was it like too? Because you were you were mentioning what what was it like to be a Canadian based crew to do this story? That might, to do it in your own backyard, you know, what I mean, to what well, you're saying, River Road Films, and you know, you guys are you're up there, you know, this, this is sort of your backyard in it to a degree to be able to share this story. What was that like for you, for you all to, to be there and be like, we know, we know this place. We're going to, we're going to give it our damnedest and, and look at what happened on the other side. And it, it came out beautifully. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's pretty special. I mean, um, I, you know, I, I travel the world and get to tell stories all over the world in India and Guatemala and Brazil. And I've been all over sharing these stories, but just to be able to work in my own backyard and just to be able to drive to location is pretty amazing. And I think that's actually, I think a lot of crews are like production companies are kind of missing the mark thinking that they have to travel to all these places. Actually, there's incredible cinematographers right here, very local, and you could use a lot less resources um, in in creating these films. um, If you just, um, you know, hire local and uh, just as long as they're capable people of be able to pull this together. So um, I hope that answers your question. Did, can you tell us, I mean, you mentioned it briefly before, but can you tell us anything else about sort of how the in, in indigenous community was involved in in the making of the film? And maybe, I mean, did they have any reservations about, about, about these types of films being made or, or were they, were they totally appreciative of the, of the concept? I mean, how, how did that 
sort of pan out if you, if you know any other information about that? I don't personally have direct communication with the nation or the first nation that we're like working on normally. Um, I know there are some locations that they did shoot and, and we always have consult. We always consult. Um, oh, actually, sorry. I, I, I did. I did have um, get to meet the wildlife guardian of a very specific area. And he brought me into this location and he showed me around. He showed me, hey, this is where we're going to go. This, you guys can film here. This is your location. He welcomed me with open arms. He gave me the keys to the, to the gate to let me in. And it was just like, it was great to actually be face to face with the with the with the people who whose land that we're filming on, and we're greatly appreciative of of being able to do that. So there there is a lot of consulting with First Nations when we go out on any shoot, if if it is required or or if we feel that it's necessary, because yeah, it's it's their land, and we want to respect that. And yeah, when you're shooting, or when you were shooting the the wolf story, I guess specifically or the wolf part of the wolf stories, what was because it was interesting when you told me too when you're when you were getting there and you're filming the sea wolves for the first time and they and they come up and they were fairly it seemed fairly comfortable with you already in your in your uh, in in the spot that you picked out. What was that like over the course of time that you were there? Like you said, obviously you had these these intimate stories, like you said with elk and and bear and you know what was it about the wolves? I guess in particular because and this is a place that I, I can tell you for myself. I, I think Stephen agrees. We want to get up there too, and we've been talking with Tom for <laughs> many long. Be like, we got to get up there and just do, you know, a, a bunch of days and and have him show us around. But it really seems that that obviously, when you title something "Island of the Sea Wolves," they are the focus of why people are probably running to watch this series. So, what was it about them for you as you're capturing all of this footage, all of their lives, or, or a portion of their lives, that stuck with you after the shoot was over? Yeah, after filming like so many different species of animals throughout the series, like one thing about wolves that I really admire and I love filming um, them is it's like they just have such unique personalities and character. And it's like this family dynamic that they have, this whole pack dynamic. I absolutely love it. I think it's just like really terrific when you get to like, you know, know each wolf individually and you can identify them. And just to see how they carry on with their day and how they interact with each other and how they play with each other and how they support each other. It's really hard, like, it's really hard living out there, as you know. And I think it's just like that. I don't know. It's just like this family connection that they have that kind of, you know, speaks to me, I guess. Um, you know, elk, they're, they're amazing. They're super cool. But they just kind of walk around, they eat grass and, you know, do anything. I love elk. I think they're super cool, especially like during the rut. But they don't, they don't have like this, like, I don't know, family bond <laughs> you get to see with wolves. I mean, obviously, when you were talking about the the pup that everybody, uh, hoping not. I mean, it's been out for a few years, so hopefully, <laughs> I'm not ruining this for anybody. But where they're talking about the pup that was, the pup that was lost, they didn't know if it'd come back, and then they, they, you know the family finds him. I'm like, oh my god, this is just it's it's a great, it's just a wonderful story for everybody to see and and to realize that there are these dynamics. Or when they're talking about, I think it was either I think it was a beached seal, or there was a carcass on the on the on the beach. And they would have to like figure out, all right, we're going to have to, you know, hit this carcass at certain times because the bears are going to come and get it or other, <laughs> other animals are going to get it. So, yeah, it's really, really unique, um, mm. that place. And you know what I was realizing, too? It's so, especially when it was raining, and I'm sure you guys, when it was storming, it wasn't great, but it's so lush and so green up there. I mean, that it was that's what really caught me, too, was the colors that you all were able to, to capture there, too, really popped out, really stood out, Um and just being able to see that. I mean, that's, again, that's a place that, you know, I got to get to eventually, but man, it just, it just really seemed like it all transferred through the camera and you guys caught it so beautifully. Yeah. One thing I, I kind of wish the story did pick up on was, um, you know, the, the, uh, and they did, they did, uh, they did address it, but the old growth logging that's going on at Vancouver Island. Yeah. We showed this beautiful, pristine, magical place, seemingly magical with like, you know, this, it's just like this perfect habitat, but realistically there is some, horrible logging practices out there and when you when you do get a chance to go out there with tom you'll see it firsthand on how bad it really is like there's like you know like i could call them like the, the beauty curtains where you'll see like these very specific areas that have like these intact areas but just over that hill it is gone it is wiped really? out and it's brutal so wow yeah do you have a do you have a shot that that made it into the film that you're just i mean maximally proud of yeah i mean uh it's like it's like the story behind it, which I like more than the shot itself. But the shot is great, I think. And it, and it is a wolf. And it's the wolf they, they named Jasper in the series. And 
um yeah we call him leo but anyway um he was uh i i was just trying to beat the tide like i had i had to kind of race back to get back to camp so the tides were coming up and i was like okay i gotta i gotta get back before i get pinched out and i had my camera in my backpack i have a huge heavy tripod i'm carrying like 50 60 pounds with the gear and i'm racing back and then um it's like we kind of just went around the corner and all of a sudden there he was he was just like we're face to face with the breeding male of the pack and we just kind of startled each other and he immediately started howling and barking and going crazy and i was like oh my god so i had to like build my can take my camera out of my backpack and build it and get it on the head and legs and i just hope he didn't take off but and 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 this wolf is actually notoriously like shy and he keeps his big far distance from us he never comes near us but i was very close to him and he didn't he did let you know he was you know aware of my presence and he let me know pretty quick but he stood there long enough for me to get a couple shots off and even in the trailer and they showed the shot a couple times in the series of just him howling um and it's i just posted on my instagram today actually that shot and it's just like this one-on-one -on -one with that wolf and got to spend a few minutes with him and just that time is just like that'll live with me forever I'm trying to find it here oh uh, God, that's wild that's what I mean. It's just yeah, like, that's cool. it's just like a few minutes. And that's, what I mean, like you could spend, you know, we've, we've talked to so many photographers and people who, you know, they spend hours and weeks and day, you know, months or whatever, and they don't get that. And it's just, it's the, it's the thing. It's almost like the law of attraction, right? Because you're, you're trying to get these certain things and you're just trying to race back to beat the tide. And all of a sudden it's just like, Oh, Hey James, I'm just going to give you this, <laughs> this, this like shot that's right here. And you uh, know, yeah, Jasper just comes in. Oh, you got it. Steven, yeah. I gotta look at it. Um, that's just so wild. I mean, that's, and it's so cool. And it's, you know, it's interesting when you said it before James about, you know, cause obviously the three of us on this conversation kind of know that, you, you know, you do the project and then you sort of move on and you almost sort of forget, was there like what you just did? It's like, all right, we wrapped, you know, filming, cinematography, all right, I'm going to move on to the next project. Cause I have to keep moving on and, and doing your thing. Like, was that, and it's funny that you just posted it today. Is it, is it sort of a, I don't know how to, explain the question I'm trying to ask, but was it, I obviously was surprised when you guys got nominated or, or it was it not a surprise, but whatever. It was just, you're like, Oh my God, we're nominated. W were you on another shoot? How did you find out that ultimately Ionless Evils was nominated and that you, that you specifically were, were nominated too? Was, were you doing something else? Was it one of those things where you got a million texts? How did that all happen? I don't know if I asked you that in the very beginning. Yeah, yeah, I was. Uh, I know exactly where I was. I was in Baffin Island uh, working on another series for River Road Films, and I, we just got off. I was three weeks on the Flow Edge filming polar bears, and I got back into this really remote community. And I remember that email coming in. It was just like this big blast to all of us. And I, the Seals got nominated for seven Emmys, and I was just like, "No way! This is unbelievable!" <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it's pretty, pretty amazing experience. <laughs> it's probably been a whirlwind I can imagine what now that now that that's there and I'm sure everybody who you know if they have if they don't know James's name before they're gonna know it now and so just get ready for the phone to start ringing I'm sure for more, for more things that you're doing um what are you know because and I saw a bunch of different things that you were and I and I think I watched a little bit of this series and I'm gonna just take a little bit of a left turn here but America the beautiful I remember watching a little bit of um, incredible animal journeys. I think I've seen bits and pieces of just what is it? Cause it was that before, I think America Beatles before mm -hmm. Island of sea of the sea wolves. Right. Or was that mm -hmm. directly after mm -hmm. I, you know, when you work on so many different series, they all kind of just blend together. And the second he said, America the beautiful. I kind of blanked. I'm like, what did I do on that show? I don't even remember. <laughs> but I, I remember. <laughs> yeah. Cause I actually filmed that. I was, uh, when I worked on that it was quite a long time ago when I was a camera assistant and I assisted, uh, Justin McGuire and we did a story on, yellow spotted salamanders and that was a that was a pretty fun shoot and that guy's a legend of the trade and i got to learn so much from him so that was a that was a fun one to work on what's it like for you do you when you're working with all of these legendary photographers and, and cinematographers what are the things that you take do you take bits and pieces from each person do you try to obviously i would imagine you want your own style and the way that you approach shoots and the way you approach projects when you're helping someone out are there little bits and pieces that you take from everybody else and sort of formulate what james freistack wants to do how does that work for you as a cinematographer oh 100 yeah i mean there's so like like i said like river road films is just has a an amazing arsenal of camera operators and um so and there's so much to learn and 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 i could learn from anything from anybody i like 
if a camera assistant that I'm out with has like a great idea or they saw something or they're like, oh, what about this angle? What about this angle? I, I, I take that on as well. And just it's just advice. It's a big collaborative thing. That's what I really enjoy, like working on these teams is this collaborative thing. And everybody likes to share information and teach each other. And and it just makes us for like a, just creating the best films that we can possibly make. So, um, yeah, so it's just taking those like things that I learned from all the other operators that I've worked with over the years and um, and uh, just kind of come up with my own style and just my own kind of work ethic. So what's the, what's the time off? Like, I just wonder too, because obviously projects, usually they come hard and heavy and fast and it's usually, you know, you do one thing, like you said, you were in there for 12 weeks or whatever it was for Island of the Sea Wolves. And then you probably move on to the next thing. What is your, how do you build in your breaks? Because I'm sure there has to be a situation where there, there can be overload and so you might not be able to be as sharp when you're trying to, like you say, capture, you have, you know, seven, five days to capture a story. Luckily it came together with the black bear, but how do you manage your self-care, I guess, when you're trying to stay on top of your game or, or just to be the best cinematographer you can be? How does that work out for you? Cause that's always something I think that when people listen, it's always about the, the push to get the shot, to get the story, to finish whatever it is. It's never really about, what are you doing to make sure that you're prepared, I guess, all the way through? What's that like for you when you go from one project to the next? Yeah, it's, um, I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> but uh, I think a lot of it has to do with, uh, when you know, when I get home, I drop my bags. My, my partner, Allison, she, she knows that I'm going to need a day or two. Like, and she's been so supportive and she's so great at, um, you know, everything and you know she'll she'll continue to walk the dog even though she's been taking the dog taking care of the dog for three weeks and walking the dog every day and uh, i get home and i just dump my bags off trash the house and i just want to sleep i need to crash and she's still like so super supportive and will still take on you know walking the dog for a few extra days while i you know get my feet underneath me again and uh so there's that but then um yeah just um i think yeah just just taking time off to do other things that I enjoy. Um, just like, just have other hobbies and, um, and you know, I, I love trail running. So I'll often just like, if I need to get back my circadian rhythm back, if I've been traveling from somewhere far away, I like, I find like running really helps a lot. So I'll just go for runs and just like focus on my sleep and, um, catching up with friends and stuff like that. So, um, and before you know it, you're gone again. So, um, yeah, you gotta kind of enjoy that time while you have it. What's a place or, an animal or a plant or something that you haven't filmed yet that you really is on your bucket list. It's at the very top. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I would say cougars in North America and to get a good story done with them. And they, they have, that has to be like the most challenging story there possibly could be. Um, and I've only seen one in my entire life. And uh, <laughs> so, I mean, it's, 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 um, I, I, that's, that's, I think that would be a great one to, 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 to go after, I think. And, um, I got some ideas on how I could do that, but it's going to, it's going to take time and time is money. So I don't, you know, I got to figure out, um, a really good solid story and a good, a good lead and, and try to figure it out because I think that that would be pretty special. I think. Yeah, they're definitely, they're, they're at the top of our list too. And just to, just to <laughs> see them, I think, you know, you see them in, you see them in zoos and other sanctuaries and stuff, but to see it out actually in the, you know, in the wild where it's, where it's meant to be is a totally different situation. Do you ever look at any of the projects you're on, any of whether, again, and the gamut, like you said, not geo and Netflix and Disney plus and CBC. Do you ever look at any of these projects and factor in, I guess, the importance factor of telling these natural stories to the public and showing how important these places are. Like you said, you mentioned the law cutting that's happening in Vancouver Island, but from your perspective as a cinematographer and showing the pictures and, and playing the sounds and, and for something to be out there that's popular, that's not like you say fiction. Do you, do you grasp sometimes when you're on a shoot, the importance of telling that story, the natural story, the conservation story, the preservation story of, of these wild places? Absolutely. Like these wildlife stories, they like play like a crucial role in like conservation and protection of our planet. And to like show these like on a on a big scale and a wider audience of people that aren't really connected or to nature, um, just and, and to have them engage with it and really understand what we have to lose if we don't like spend time to appreciate it and protect it, um, is really important to me. So that's that's kind of like what I love most about 
this job is just trying to, it's just like opening people's eyes to, you know, what's out there and what we have to lose. So. Yeah. What's the, I know you were saying with the Island of Seawolves, you had the, the, the older generation that was coming up to you and realizing that, Hey, this place is, <laughs> didn't realize that these places existed to a degree. What was, is, is that a lot of what you were getting once the, the series was, was released that people were coming to you and go, Oh my God, you were on this series or anything that you've worked on. Is that somewhat satisfactory for you? Be like, Oh, I brought these, these far away places to these people. And if anybody, has anybody said, I'm going to go to this place and they've actually done it. I wonder if that's ever happened in the, in the time that you've done anything. Well, actually, I'm getting a bit of flack now because now apparently, like, because um, uh, tourism for wildlife is actually going like on the on the rise on Vancouver Island. So when you meet some local photographers, for example, they'll just be a little bit like, "What have you done? <laughs> There's all these photographers out here now. <laughs> we want to uh, spot to ourselves." Um, but but amazing. I mean, you know, it's just, it's just like having conversations with people at coffee shops. You get to meet, and you know, like I, I like to bring it up and just like, hey, have you seen us? So I just want to see people's reactions. I like to like gauge people and see what they say and see what they think, and and yeah. I, w- I wish I had captured my little guy watching it a few days ago. He, he he's like 16 months old, but he was loving it. <laughs> he was howling with wolves and stuff. And oh, I'd love to see that too. But I think what's the What's the th- what's the next thing for you? Is there a project you could talk about? Is there something that you ha- you have in the works? Is this downtime for you right now? What's sort of in the future for you, James? Right now is downtime. Um, it's um, a nice time to like reassess, recalibrate, kind of see, you know, just actually it's kind of nice to have that break because then you could just go, all right, well, what do I want to focus on next? Where do I want to take it from here? And so we're yeah, definitely in development of a lot of different things right now. We have some projects that are like, let's say like yellow lit, not quite like green lit yet, but uh, they're a go ahead and we're develop on uh, developing, you know, a lot of other stories. Um, and so there's that. And then also education. I definitely want to start getting more into educating and and, and, and teaching people uh, the craft and the trade of, of cinematography. So that's uh, something I'm leading into for the 2024. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah, when you, I, I didn't ask this early on, what is it when you're on a big shoots like these, what are the, I'm sure there are ethics being taken into consideration about where, where and I'm sure Tom was there too. Like in terms of, how how much are we disturbing the the natural flow of wildlife? Obviously, like things happen or whatever. Is is that something that's uh, permeated through the production process where it's like, all right, we're gonna try and get these things. Do the boundaries ever get pushed? How do you how do you feel that that goes usually for big projects like this? Yeah, our our code of ethic for especially the the crew that we work around, um, we we don't push it. We we try to stay as little input as possible. We we go up, we put blinds up. We try to be discreet. We don't want to like. It just doesn't. It doesn't make for nice cinematography when the animal knows you're there scared and they're just looking at you and they're scared and they're running away. It's like nobody wants to see that. I don't want to film that. I don't want to be a part of that. So if, right. if if we feel like the animal's uncomfortable, we leave. We just back off, give it some space, and you know if it, if it's calm and relaxed, maybe we'll go back in. But if not, we'll just we'll just have to miss the shot, unfortunately, because it's just it's not yeah. beneficial to anybody. Nobody wants to watch a scared animal. I don't want to film one either. So big yeah. eyes, wide eyes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and just yeah. just staring at you, <laughs> staring like, at the camera. <laughs> <right>. <laughs> like that's not that's not yeah. a nice shot. So yeah, yeah, no, it's the same thing. No, I'm, I'm I figured as much. It's just it's always something we, we we like to approach and broach because it's you never know. I know there are others uh, probably out there that are doing you know, and, and it's good. We we've talked with a lot of photographers and they put especially in their any of their reels anything like that. So no bait, no trap, you know, no camera trap stuff like that. But just something I always ask. So give everybody the the best place. I know you have. We're gonna have James's website and his Instagram in there, so you guys can check out because your website's awesome, by the way. Like really great. Like I saw I saw your reel and stuff like that, but. Give everybody more, um, g- give them the, the addresses for that. And also for River Road Films, like where can they go to, to see a lot of these projects? Um, I know obviously we've promoted Island of, Island of Sea Wolves. That's on Netflix. What are, the, what are some other uh, things that you've worked on that you want to promote right now? Like go for it, like the floor is yours basically. Well, I mean, I'm wearing this shirt. This is Shared Planet. <laughs> and um, so Shared Planet's going to be a series on CBC in Canada. And we're also getting some uh, worldwide distribution as well. And that should, we finished uh, filming that in September. And that should come out in sometime in 2025. So they're deep in the edit now. And 
up to go uh, early 2025, I believe. And um, so that's through River Road Films. You can check out River Road Films to learn more about uh, the organization that I work with uh, primarily. And for myself, I pretty much do most of myself on Instagram and uh, YouTube. So James Frystack, uh, uh, James underscore Frystack, uh, Instagram and jamesfrystack.com. What's, oh, yeah. um, what's Shared Planet going to be? What's the, the premise of Shared Planet when it's coming <laughs> in 2025? Well, I hope I don't butcher it because um, I, I, I haven't perfected my elevator speech of like what Shared Planet is about. But Shared Planet is um, a story about conservation stories around the globe. And it's trying to highlight stories where they're doing things correctly, like where they're actually had some significant challenges with um, whatever their challenges were around the world. And um, but they were able to solve it. And they're trying to be like examples and leaders of like how we could do things differently and how we can coexist with wildlife and nature. Wow. And that's so that's so that's CBC, and you said there is going to be some international distribution because I know sometimes when I I want to watch something from that's CBC written here in the states or that's filmed and it's uh, distributed by CBC, sometimes up in uh, in the states can't get it. So you said there is going to be some sort of distribution yeah. down the line. Okay, all right. Yeah, I, I I don't know what that looks like quite yet, so that's yet to be determined, I believe. So, okay. Yeah, either way. I know, just, we just, you don't want to miss those certain things. We're like, I can't watch this unless I have a code. I <laughs> like, I know yeah. somebody well, was on uh, the film. <laughs> there, there, are, there are multiple series. I worked on a series with River Road Films. It's called uh, Islands, uh, Nature's Wild Laboratories. And it's on Sky TV. And there's a, there's an entire episode on Baffin Islands, an entire episode on Vancouver Island. And uh, we can't watch it in Canada. Really? But they lost the North American distribution for some reason. And it's shown around the world, but we can't even watch it here. So, yeah, it's really unfortunate. It's crazy to me. Like there's all these deals that happen and then people, you just like, you want so information. Now. I know it's crazy with all the streaming rights and stuff. It's, it's wild, you know, yeah. and you miss stuff. Um, well, my last question for you, James, is when you hear the word wolf, what's the thing that comes to your mind? Misunderstood. Hmm. They're beautiful so, animals. So misunderstood. And I think people just need to read a little bit more. Watch some more Island of the Sea Wolves. Watch watch any any kind of documentaries. Listen to your guys' podcast and understand that these wolves deserve to be here. And um, they're just beautiful animals. Yeah. No. Well, thank you, and thank you for for the promotion and the plug for us. I, pre- I appreciate it. And you know, you're listen. I I can't wait to go through your cinematography list of stuff that you've worked on because I'm gonna plug some of this stuff in over the weekend when I'm decompressing so I can look at some stuff. But uh, James Freistack, once again, first again, congratulations on the Emmy Island of the Sea Wolves and you know, any, any other project that you're working on that you want to come and talk to us about, you have uh, an open invitation to come back. So thank you for spending some time after the holidays and, and giving us uh, the lowdown of everything that was going on in Vancouver Island. Really appreciate it. Yeah. yeah that was great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Great being on the show. Of course. Uh, Just stick around for a minute while we sign off. Uh, How's to you all out there? And Stephen, I'll be with you next time. Bye, everybody. Looking for more information about Wolf Connection or the podcast? Please visit our website at wolfconnection.org where you can donate, sponsor a wolf, or become a volunteer.